So, good afternoon, everybody. Yeah, at first I wish to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak here. And then I have to disclose that I, uh, from time to time, am a consultant for MRCOM testing services. Uh, the main topic of this session is MR safety. And uh, the first um, question was, well, where do the risks come from? And the answer is quite easy. It's all physics. Well, <laughs> MR imaging is basically harmless, harmless, but it's not without hazards. First, the good news. Producing images using magnetic resonance is basically harmless because there is no ionizing radiation acting on tissue. And uh, the electromagnetic fields we need for MR imaging have no interactions with body tissue, which result in a permanent effect if they are applied correctly. Um, there is a multitude of physical effects, and these effects have a substantial hazard potential, and this hazard potential increases with the magnetic field strength. So um, more, well, uh, low, low hazard at low field strength, 0.5 and high hazards at high field strength, 7 Tesla. Uh, but I concentrate in the intermediate range, uh, 1.5 and 3 Tesla. So there's a considerable accident risk with carelessness and wrong handling. So it's uh, necessary to know what you are actually doing. Um, let's first have a look on the fields, of the electromagnetic fields and magnetic resonance. At first, there is this uh, static magnetic field, B0, which is produced in a coil which you usually don't see. And also in this image, we don't see the coil. We see only the dewer filled with liquid helium in which this coil is immersed. Um, then we have so-called switched gradients produced by a set of gradient coils, a tube, which is then pushed into the, the uh, opening of the main field coil dewer, uh, and uh, these gradients uh, modify the static magnetic field. Um, and then we have the radio frequency coil uh, producing the B1 field, a radio frequency field used for spin excitation. There are other coils and scanners, for example, like this. Um, these are also radio frequency coils, but they are for acquisition only. They don't produce uh, uh, fields of their own, so they don't add to specific hazards. Now let's go through the, uh, these electromagnetic fields. Let's start with the static magnetic field. Uh, what do we need it for? Well, for the alignment of spins and for the generation of the precession after spin excitation. Where is this field? Of course, it's within the coil of the magnet, within the bore of the magnet. It's homogeneous in the magnet bore, and the field lines are parallel to the bore, which means in head-foot direction or foot-head direction. Uh, if you have open magnets, then the field lines are between the poles, and the field lines are orthogonal to the patient, which means anterior-posterior, or if the patient is lying sideways, uh, left-right. Um, but this field is not only inside the magnet bore, there is a fringe field. Um, and this can extend several meters around the scanner, and this defines the controlled access area. That's the area uh, uh, where the uh, access must be restricted. And the access area is defined by the field strength of 0.5 millitesla or 5 gauss. Uh, when does this field act? Well, always. If you have a superconducting coil, which is the usual thing today, then the uh, field is always switched on. It can't be easily switched off. Typical field values are 0.5 Tesla to well, 7 Tesla. Compare the Earth magnetic field, it's 0 0.05 millitesla, or 0.5 Gauss, half a Gauss. Interaction with body tissue, well, there is no real interaction. Uh, tissue is diamagnetic, and so uh, there are no reproducibly measured effects uh, in bio on biological tissue and cells which uh, have a permanent effect. Of course, tissue is conductive, which means uh, due to movement of tissue or blood 
in an inhomogeneous strong magnetic field, there is current induction, but the effects of uh, these currents are so small that we can neglect it for the moment. <coughs> if you have paramagnetic substances in the skin, of course, uh, then if these substances have an anisotropic susceptibility, you may feel uh, that there may be an effect of translation or rotation, and this may happen, for example, with specific pigments and specific tattoos, and this will cause skin irritation, but this is very rare. <coughs> More important are interactions with objects. Uh, ferromagnetic objects in a strong, um, strong magnetic field, they, uh, they feel an attraction. Uh, magnetizable matter, iron and nickel, is uh, attracted into the direction of the increasing field, which means uh, into the bore, towards the bore, and the uh, onset of, uh, uh, of considerable force may be quite sudden. Additionally, there is torque. Long objects uh, are, tend to be uh, moved parallel to the uh, magnetic field. If you have electric equipment or magnetic data storage equipment, then you have a loss of function, uh, or then a loss of function is possible uh, already in the fringe field. Uh, not, it need not be very much ne very near the, uh, the magnet already in the fringe field. It is possible that the electronic equipment loses its function or losing its operating information. The Attraction, the force of attraction, Fa, is of course proportional to the magnetic field, stronger magnetic fields with stronger attraction, but not only. Um, actually, it's uh, proportional on the, um, on the product of the strong magnetic, of the magnetic field and the change of the magnetic field with distance to the isocenter, dB0 over dz. The spatial gradient of the static magnetic field. Do not mix it up with the switch gradient, which, will be, uh, which I will talk about later. <coughs> so this is half of a scanner. So th this, is a, this is the entrance to the scanner bore, and this is the isocenter here on the left side. And then the isocenter of the scanner, uh, the magnetic field, B0, is highest and then it drops off near the enter of the bore and uh, away from, from the scanner, it's, it's not so high. Um, the change of the magnetic field with distance from the isocenter, this grad the, the, the spatial gradient of the static magnetic field is low in the center of the magnet, of course. There we have a homogeneous magnetic field. We need a homogeneous field for imaging. Um, near the uh, opening near the, the entrance to the bore, the field decrease is largest, so which means that there the, uh, the uh, gradient is largest. And uh, now the force, dark blue, is a product of the red field and the light blue gradient. So the force has about this uh, form, it's low in the center or absent or low in the center of the magnet, far away from the magnet, or it's also small. Uh, it's highest and can be quite high uh, at the bore opening. Then we have the torque. Well, the torque is highest in the center of the magnet because it's proportional to the B0 field, the square of the B0 field. So this is highest in the center of the magnet following the red line. Um, just to give you an, an, an idea about the forces which we have, so this uh, we, we, we tried this on a small iron drawer key. It says Eurolox, but it's uh, valid in other continents as well. Um, the key weighs seven grams, and then we put it on a thread and measured the force with which this, with which this key was drawn into the scanner. And uh, well, if you look very good, you can see that this says. 800 gram. So as a very rough estimate, you can say that the, <coughs> the, the force with which uh, an object will be drawn into the scanner may be quite, uh, may, may be well uh, above 100 times the weight of the iron 
which uh, deal uh, with which uh, is the source of this attractive force. So the forces can be considerable. This is a library step stool from steel. Uh, it's it looks like this if it's in a three Tesla scanner. And when it was outside of the three Tesla scanner, you see the shape. And if you consider how difficult it is to to uh, press together um, a round tube of steel, you can consider that the forces are uh, quite uh, considerable. And if somebody else is inside the, this bore, then this is not good. Um, so. So much for the static magnetic field, now the switched gradient fields. We need this for a position dependent modification of the B0 field, which we need for the spatial encoding of the resonance signal. The gradient fields are present in the magnet bore, where the gradient coils were, which we saw before. And the highest gradient field increase is at the bore opening. Uh, then there's a small fringe field outside the bore, which we can neglect. neglect. Um, this field is effective only during the scan. Typical values, <coughs> well, uh, usually you uh, characterize the gradients uh, with the gradient steepness and slew rate. Actually, this means uh, that the magnitude of field change is dependent on the position in the bore and the maximum uh, field change may be about 30 millitesla. The speed of field change is also depending on the position in the bore. The maximum value can reach about 90 tesla per second. It looks like this. So this, this is a scanner bore. This, uh, this is a, a gradient field in, this, uh, in that direction. This is a linear part of the gradient. This is the area which you can use for imaging. This is the maximum field of view. And outside the maximum field of view, uh, the, the gradient becomes nonlinear. So the uh, maximum uh, field change is slightly outside your maximum field of view. And you see that, uh, well, while during the last 30 years, the magnetic field strength remained about the same or didn't change that much between 1.5 Tesla, 4 Tesla in early years, 3 Tesla now. Uh, in contrast to this, the maximum maternal gradient strength and ramp durations, they changed quite a, uh, quite a lot. 1985, we started with 3 millitesla per meter. Today, we are at 80 millitesla per meter. They became also faster. Ramp duration was 2 milliseconds in, the, in earlier days and 0.2 milliseconds today. And now this means for the maximum field change, we started with 0.4 Tesla per second. And now we are uh, at about 60 Tesla per second, uh, nearly, well, 30 centimeter away from the ISO center. So if this is an ISO center, uh, so slightly outside the field of view, uh, this is the maximum between the field change. Well, we, uh, of course, this is maximum value. It will not always be reached. Um, What's the effect of the switch gradient fields? Well, the gradient fields, as uh, they are switched in the uh, audio frequencies, they are responsible for the very loud noise. Uh, the other is a possible nerve stimulation. Why this? You see, we have ramp durations in the order of milliseconds or fractions of milliseconds. This is fast, but not very fast. Um, we have a unidirectional induction of currents uh, in the order of, uh, yeah, let's say, milliseconds or tens of milliseconds. And this is long enough to be considered by a nerve as a true nerve signal. So we have nerve stimulation by induction of currents due to the uh, switch gradient fields. Um, <coughs> The first nerves that can be stimulated are peripheral nerves. So we have peripheral nerve stimulation. When does it happen? Well, it depends on ramp duration and change of the magnetic field. And uh, this are, uh, is for an exponential model. Model uh, the threshold of uh, peripheral nerve stimulation. Well, peripheral nerve stimulation may be 
annoying, but it's in itself it's not dangerous. The problem is that uh, organ nerve stimulation, especially cardiac stimulation, must be avoided. And if you are above the level of peripheral nerve stimulation, then you don't know how far you are away from cardiac stimulation. This is the reason why the uh, peripheral nerve stimulation threshold is uh, used as a limit for the safe scanning to prevent stimulation of cardiac nerves, which means if uh, peripheral nerve stimulation occurs, you have to stop the scan. The third field is a radio frequency field. We need this for spin excitation and for the generation of the spin resonance signals and the spin echo pulses. Uh, it happens in the magnet bore and the uh, position of the radio fre uh, frequency transmitting coil during the pulses. Typical value of the uh, of, of the B1 field, the magnetic portion is about 30 microtesla. The pulse power can up can be up to 20 kilowatts. The frequency, well, it depends on B0, it's between uh, 21 and 200, uh, well, roughly between 20 and 300 megahertz. Um, the physical effects, we have current of voltage induction in conductive material because of the temporal change of the magnetic field. Um, the frequency is so high that we have mostly heat production. The method for the heat production is the specific absorption rate, SIR. Let's have a look on the radio frequency field. <coughs> this is an oscillation at 1.5 Tesla, uh, about 64 megahertz. At three Tesla, we have the double frequency, which means at once the steepness of the magnetic field change doubles, and then we have the frequency, which also doubles. So the SIR, the heat production, is four times as high as for 1.5 Tesla. At 7 Tesla, we have already 22 times as much heat production as for 1.5 Tesla. One of the well, problems of 7 Tesla, which may uh, be the reason that 7 Tesla will not be in the clinical routine use everywhere so soon. Um, so the change of magnetic field um, per time unit is uh, faster than for the gradient fields, which means that relevant power transfer is due to the radio frequency pulses, not to gradient pulses. The frequency is too high for stimulation, so we have heat uh, production, uh, which is homogeneously uh, homogeneous over the body, but only if you have homogeneous conductivity. The heating is limited by implementation on SAR limits, hardware and software and the scanner. Um, well, but there are remain risks. One risk is present if the patient has an impaired thermal regulation, then the SAR limit may be too high and you have to regulate uh, the specific absorption rate of your excitation by yourself. Uh, the other problem is that there may be locally increased uh, radio frequency irradiation, so-called hot spots if you use inhomogeneous transmit coils or if you have standing wave effects in higher fields. And there may be locally concentrated heat release if the conductivity is inhomogeneous. An example for the last is this. This is a closed loop. If the, um, well, the loop is closed over a skin-skin contact, which is okay for high frequency uh, for transmission of, 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 of high frequency currents, but the uh, resistance of the spin spin contact is higher than the uh, resistance within the uh, tissue. So the heat will be released not homogeneously over the tissue, but especially at the skin skin contact. And this may lead to, well, uh, quite high temperatures resulting in second or third degree burns. The risky situations are when, when the patient has not uh, properly dressed uh, feet-feet contacts or uh, contacts here, knee-knee or tie-tie contacts, hand contacts. One has to avoid this. Um, sorry, wrong direction. <laughs> uh, interaction with objects. Um, here, uh, we refer to objects with high electrical conductivity, which are all metals, 
also non-magnetic ones. Sometimes this is mixed up. People think, well, uh, the problem is only with uh, magnetic metals. No, all metals are electroconductive, also carbon fibers and carbon rods. Uh, there we have an induction due to the change of the magnetic component, dB over dt, in ring structures and conductic loops, but also uh, in uh, induction due to the electric component E of the radio frequency field and long conductors. Non conductors act as hertz and dipoles, like antennas, wires. Um, and, well, if you have uh, implants, uh, the induced currents are concentrated in these good electrical conductors and metals, and you have an increased current density where large sheeting is possible, especially where the current crosses the metal tissue interface. Um, and the current drawn into an implant is larger the longer this implant is. Here you see uh, the specific absorption rate uh, along a stent, and uh, at the end of the stents you see that there's a high uh, uh, specific absorption rate, and uh, the absorption rate, the possible heating, increases with the length of the stent. Uh, there's another effect. If the metallic implant has a specific length, then standing waves may uh, be created in this, <coughs> in this implant, um, giving uh, nodes and antinodes at the end of the, uh, of the implant. And uh, extreme heating is then possible if uh, uh, resonance occurs. And these standing waves are possible, well, if one assumes that the body uh, has uh, the dielectricity constant of water, then it's at 1.5 tesla, uh, 26 centimeters, or 3 tesla, 13 centimeters. Um, metallic objects longer than this length pose a specific heating risk. Um, so that induction is maybe a problem, as shown here. Look here. This is a carbon rod, a so-called uh, non-magnetic um, rod for fixator extern. Uh, I made this slide for the case that the film didn't work, but uh, here you see we have sparking on the conductor end. This is a fixator extern. This is non-metallic. This is carbon, but still we have induction there. Uh, if this type of induction, if this type of induction uh, occurs inside the body, this may be quite hazardous. Uh, here we see a hemorrhage due to a heating at the electrode tip of a neurostimulator, where, well, sort of um, heating at the conductor end happened now inside the head. Oh, uh, well. <laughs> This was an accidental spark when testing a guide wire in a mini pig. Um, so you see, uh, this is not only in uh, plant experiments as in my film before, but accidentally it happened as well. So, um, so much to the electromagnetic fields. There's another thing which one should uh, consider that's uh, Again, connected to the main static, uh, the main field, which is produced by a superconducting coil. To make a coil superconducting, you need cryogen, and cryogen is liquid helium. Typically, uh, you are like this, may be filled up to uh, about 1,600 liters liquid helium. And if the helium evaporates, it um, um, suffers a 770 forward expansion, which means that this uh, one, 1,600 liter evaporate into about uh, 1,200 cubic meters. Now, um, a room, uh, the scanner room, may be as small as 50 cubic meters. In this case, you would have, after a quench into the room, an overpressure of about 26 bar. Uh, so, to prevent this, you have to check the quench lines 
leading uh, the uh, liquid helium, um, the evaporated liquid helium uh, outside. If you have um, if you have an increased danger of a quench, for example, if people work on the helium fittings, then you should secure escape routes and keep doors open to be able to run away if actually an in-room quench happens. Uh, also, uh, if a quench occurs, even if everything is okay, uh, in the quen on the, in, in intact quench lines, air may condense at the cold pipes, and you have a cryo-burning hazard if the contact with drops, because these drops are not water, but condensed liquid oxygen. This increases the fire hazard again, and also it, well, it uh, causes truer burning. So also you should go away from this. If a quench happens, an in-room quench happens, uh, the scanner may look like this. And if actually the pressure in the scanner room is too high, uh, the helium gas might find its way through, through the roof. So to sum up, the risks are static magnetic field B0 in and around the scanner. The main risk is force and torque on ferromagnetic objects. And we have the moderately fast audio frequency alternating magnetic add-on fields, switch gradient fields. Uh, risk is induction of currents, noise, and nerve stimulation. The pulse radio frequency field in the range of the transmitting coil. Risk is induction, warming, and if you have electric conductor, strong heating. And the crew system of the MR scanner, well, it may quench, then you have an emission of cold helium. Uh, a final remark, uh, how to go, uh, to work with implants, passive and active implants. Um, if a person comes, uh, a patient comes with an implant, consult the implant passport and the product information before entering the scanner room. And check for the labeling according to the ASTM standard. If an implant is labeled conditional, then still do not allow the patient to enter the scanner room. Check the conditions for a safe MR examination first. Yeah, that's it. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>